This program is brought to you by Emory University. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening, and welcome to this Alonzo L. McDonald Lecture. It's a great privilege to have all of you here. Thank you so much for coming. My name is John Witte. I serve as director of the Center for the Study of Law and Religion, the sponsor of this evening's lecture. The McDonald Lecture is one of our special forums in our Center for the Study of Law and Religion. The lecture is named in honor of Ambassador Alonzo L. McDonald, who is with us this evening. Ambassador McDonald is one of the proudest sons of Emory University, a graduate of Emory College, a for many years trustee, uh, the Board of Trustees at Emory University, now serving as trustee emeritus. He has been a distinguished leader of church, of state, of society, uh, and of public life. Um, as a businessman, especially, he's won world-renowned success running the Bendix Corporation, uh, world CEO of the uh, McKinsey and Company. Uh, since 1983, he's been chair of the Avenir Group and distinguished himself uh, in the financial investment world. Uh, he served for a time at the Harvard Business School and has been lauded around the world for his uh, remarkable work as a business leader. As a leader of, uh, of politics and of statecraft, uh, he was U.S. Ambassador uh, to the GATT, the organization of one of the most important private international trade agreements in the world, uh, serving for a number of years in Geneva, negotiating on the United States' behalf uh, for the GATT and its interests. Uh, from that, he became, with Hamilton Jordan, the leader of President Carter's White House and distinguished himself in service to the president and to the country in that capacity. As a leader of the church, Ambassador McDonald was the founder and current uh, senior fellow in the Trinity Forum, which has been a remarkable uh, organization uh, bringing ministry to various parts of the country and indeed around the world, uh, especially with its beautiful pamphlets that many of which he has authored or edited himself. Uh, but he's especially been important in the establishment with his family of the Alonzo L. McDonald Family Foundation. And that foundation has been dedicated to sponsoring cutting-edge Christian scholarship in elite universities around the world. Uh, he has established uh, centers, he has supported chairs, he's established programs and projects uh, at Harvard, at Yale, University of Chicago, at Duke, at Cambridge, at Oxford, and happily at Emory University as well. At Emory, uh, many of you will know him from his work in the McDonald uh, Chair in Jesus and Culture, which has brought a series of distinguished lecturers to our campus, beginning with Yaroslav Pelikan, the late great church historian at Yale, followed by the Honorable John T. Noonan, Jr., and a series of distinguished scholars since. Um, he has also been a very generous benefactor to our Center for the Study of Law and Religion. He has sponsored a set of projects, including a project on Christian jurisprudence that's now coming to its conclusion. Uh, that project has brought together 20 major Orthodox, Catholic, and Protestant scholars, each of whom are writing a book or two, and the project is now in its writing phase and will yield some 30 volumes over the next uh, year and a half. As part of that Christian jurisprudence project, Ambassador McDonald was kind enough to support this Alonzo L. McDonald lecture, and it's that lecture which we'll have the privilege of hearing this evening. Prior lecturers have included Nicholas Waltersdorf from Yale, uh, Robert Bella from Berkeley, Martin Marty from the University of Chicago, and others. It's a special honor to have Ambassador McDonald as our special friend, as our special counselor, as our critic, and as our generous supporter and philanthropist here at Emory. And I hope I don't embarrass him too much by asking him to rise and receive our robust applause and appreciation for all that he has done for us. We are honored this evening to have Patrick Allett as the McDonald Lecturer for the study of the pursuit of happiness, the issue that we have confronted in a variety of public forums and that Professor Allett is going to lead us in this evening with his special expertise on American intellectual and political history. Uh, Professor Allett is a graduate of Oxford University, of the University of California at Berkeley, with a postdoc at Harvard Divinity School. He has been at Emory since 1988 in the Department of History, where he now serves as the Cahoon Family Chair in, the hist in American history. Some of you will know him from his riveting and pithy 
uh, op-eds that have appeared in the New York Times and the Times Literary Supplement and the Chronicle of Higher Education and in dozens of other media. Some of you will know him for some of his 240 odd recorded lectures on English history, on American history, on American religious history, on the art of teaching. Some of you will know him from his pathbreaking work in American religious history, culminating amongst others in his award-winning title, American Religion Since 1945, published by Columbia University Press. Some of you will know him from his work on American intellectual history, especially the history of Catholicism and the history of conservatives, who are sometimes Catholic, sometimes not. And that work has culminated amongst others in a new Yale University Press title, The Conservatives. However you know him, after this evening we will all know him as one of the great authorities on the history of the pursuit of happiness in American history and a comparative understanding of that view with England and America in conversation. Professor Allen is kind enough to give us a lecture this evening. I hope that you will join me in offering him a robust round of applause to welcome him here. Thank you so much. It's a very great pleasure to be here. When you hear the phrase, the pursuit of happiness, at once you think of the Declaration of Independence. And if you grew up in America, the chances are that you've been hearing the Declaration of Independence and hearing about it ever since you began to speak and to learn how to talk and how to read. Now, it sometimes happens, doesn't it, that when you, when you hear a form of words again and again and again, you become so familiar with them that it's a little bit difficult to step back and think about what they mean. Uh, many of you probably had the experience in early life of reciting the Pledge of Allegiance many, many times, but then eventually when you were nine or 10 or in your early teens, for the first time began thinking, ah, oh, that's what I'm saying, that's what I'm pledging, this is what I really mean. Similarly with the Lord's Prayer, if you had a Christian upbringing, you probably said it many times before you began to really think about its significance. And the Declaration of Independence is, is like that. It's one of those often repeated documents. Now by contrast, because I came from England, I never read the Declaration of Independence until I was a first year graduate student in American history at the University of California in Berkeley. And as soon as I did read it, the thing that struck me straight away was how wrong it was. Because it says that we, the Continental Congress, that is the representatives of the American colonies, are now declaring our independence and that we're entitled to do so because King Henry, because King George III, Henry, George III is becoming a tyrant. But actually he wasn't, he wasn't becoming a tyrant. Uh, Britain itself had been through a whole series of revolutions in the 1640s and 50s and then again in the 1680s to make it absolutely impossible for the British monarch to be tyrannical. It certainly is the case that the British government was acting in an obtuse way in the 1760s and 70s. There's no doubt about that. But tyranny, no, that was wrong. But I was struck also by the wrongness of many of the other parts of the Declaration, particularly its most famous passages. Listen to one of them. You've all heard it before. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, I don't suppose that anybody in this room actually believes that. This is one of these forms of words that simply become so familiar, you've started to accept it as right, even though you don't really think it. Apart from anything else, are these self-evident truths? Self-evident implies that they're so obviously true, they simply could not not be true. If somebody said to me, it's lighter at midday than it is at midnight, I would regard that as a self-evident truth. It's just simply impossible of refutation. But something as, as obscure as the claim that God has given us an inalienable right to the pursuit of happiness, you might believe it, but surely even you won't say that it's self-evidently true. No, these aren't self-evident at all. They're highly contentious propositions, which you might think about as aspirations, but surely not as truths. Now, let me hasten to say that this doesn't lead me to imply or to, or to assert the, the, the wrongness of the American Revolution or anything like that. I'm quibbling with the document itself, but not with the, the movement which it, it signifies, which is much too uh, uh, important. And in fact, I also, I've got no criticism with the American 
enthusiasm for equality. In fact, coming from, from Britain, there's almost nothing that's more exhilarating uh, than the, the seriousness with which the American people take equality. It's something that hardly ever comes up in Britain, or it certainly didn't in my childhood. But here, the, the gravity and the seriousness with which Americans devote themselves to equality is bracing and liberating and energizing in the, in the best possible way, I think. Now think about, but, but equality itself is a, is a complicated concept. We actually live in a society which depends upon human inequality. And the more complicated our society gets, the more essential it is to us to have the inequalities. Yeah? You think of all, the, all the, the difficult work that various groups of people do. It's because they're specialists. It's because they're capable of doing things which, which most of their uh, fellow countrymen can't possibly do. As society becomes more complex, we depend upon the fascinating variety of inequalities. So again, that leads me to suggest that, although equality is inspiring, it's... It's not a self-evident truth. In fact, you could take the view that nature goes to extravagant lengths to disprove the idea of human equality. Uh, you've only got to look around among yourselves to see how right that is. Now, there's also... <laughs> it's true, isn't it? Yeah? There's also something very odd about the claim that, especially in America, in these American colonies, that uh, the, 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 the God-given right to the pursuit of happiness is a self-evident truth. You've only got to go back a few decades in American history to find people for whom a, a remark like that is absolutely unimaginable. Think about Cotton Mather or Jonathan Edwards, the great Puritan preachers. Uh, Jonathan Edwards is famous for his sermon, Sin is in the Hands of an Angry God, in which he says, we're as, as revolting as spiders, and we're hanging from a single thread over the pit of hell, and God, with the merest flick of his hand, can fling us down into eternal damnation and torment, and we deserve it. It's impossible to imagine Jonathan Edwards saying, what's life all about? It's about the pursuit of happiness. And so, no... <laughs> Obviously, what we're looking at here is a very particular moment in the history of the development of political philosophy. And Thomas Jefferson, who was deputed by the, Con the Continental Congress to head the subcommittee that wrote the Declaration, is responding to his own reading in the French and the Scottish Enlightenment traditions. Pursuit of happiness has got a very this-worldly tone as well, hasn't it? I mean, when you, if you say to someone that they're interested in the pursuit of happiness. It doesn't sound like a religious idea at all. It sounds like a very worldly one. And I think it's interesting to, again, test it, test the phrase in the context of, of biblical language. Can you imagine a talk called Abraham and the Pursuit of Happiness? Or Moses and the Pursuit of Happiness? I was browsing the Bible to see if I could find some examples of the pursuit of happiness in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, and it's hard to find. But here's one. This is from Psalm 149. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud upon their beds. In other words, the children of Israel are thinking about God and worshipping him, and it's making them happy. But what are they thinking about? Here's how it goes on. Let the praises of God be in their mouths and a two-edged sword in their hand to execute vengeance upon the heathen, to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with links of iron. In other words, it's a kind of vengeance fantasy from a warrior society which is exulting over God's favoritism to uh, mash their enemies down into the dust. It doesn't have a kind of pursuit of happiness flavor to it at all, does it? Or not, not, not a sort of Jeffersonian one, anyway. The other thing that's odd about the Declaration of Independence is this. Um, Jefferson was influenced by a generation of political philosophers, if you think about Hobbes and Locke in Britain and um, Rousseau in France, who all begin with the idea of the state of nature. This claim that there was once a, a situation in which individual, atomized individuals were wandering about, but as Hobbes says, in a state of nature, life is nasty, poor, mean, brutish, and short. And the claim is that eventually they came together and made p compacts which made it possible for them to create civil society. And, they, and from this, these original compacts, that society and government grew up. But again, what's striking to us, I think, is that it's not true. There never was a state of nature. I mean, we know far more about history and about anthropology than they did. And we know that this whole uh, area of political philosophy is itself based upon an imagined state of nature which didn't actually happen.
So, so much for the Declaration of Independence. I just want, this is all a digression, really. I just wanted to throw in these remarks to sort of defamiliarize you from the idea that it's something we can simply accept as being uncontrovertibly true, because in fact, it very much isn't. Now, as I said, I grew up in England where people don't talk about equality, or at least they certainly didn't when I was a kid. On the contrary, Britain's got a very, very hierarchical system, and the assumption there is that everybody's got a place on the ladder. Certain people are your superiors, certain others are your inferiors. You've got your place, and you've got your station and its duties. You have responsibilities to some, duties towards others. And it certainly isn't the case that people who are in the lower uh, rungs of the ladder are burning with indignation about it. Not at all. Uh, social inequality has been so unremarkable in, so, in most of the societies in the history of the world that it hasn't been the source of constant indignation. And there hasn't been a perpetual ferment of, of furious indignation on behalf of equality over against that. The other great difference, of course, with Britain is that it's got a state church. And I'm a member of it. I'm a member of the Church of England. In fact, you're a member of the Church of England unless you make a point of saying that you're not. Uh, if, you, if you want to say, if you, if, for example, if you join the army, in Britain, and they say, what religion are you? And you say, Catholic, they write Catholic. But if you say, non, they write C of E, Church of England. Yeah? It's a default position. You belong unless, they, unless you absolutely claim that you don't belong. Now, the Church of England was a branch of the state, and for centuries it had got nothing at all to say about equality. On the contrary, it was, it was integral to this class hierarchical society. Now, it does sometimes happen in... Uh, in Anglican, in all parts of the Christian world, that you talk about inversions. The last shall be first, and the first shall be last. But that isn't a matter of equality. That's a matter of turning over the hierarchy. In other words, maintaining inequalities, but the other way round, rather than having this leveling, which is such a powerful idea in the United States. Now, of course, one of the great differences between the two countries is that the United States does have the First Amendment, and very, very soon after the American Revolution, the separation of church and state was uh, embodied in the fact that not only was there not a federally established religion, but even the state churches, of which there had been many up to the Revolution, very quickly dismantled themselves to create a condition of almost complete religious freedom. Now, what that's meant in practice is that in America, religious and political controversies have been kept separate. You see, if in England you had a disagreement with the government, you had some sort of political um, uh, problem, the chances are that you become indignant with the church as well as with the government, because the, the church was part of the government, they were integral. By contrast, in the United States it often happened that people who were politically dissatisfied in some way nevertheless looked to their church as a source of strength because the church itself wasn't contaminated with politics. There's no question, if you're looking for a condition where the religion is going to be healthy, one of the first things that you ought to do is to separate them. And one of the great successes of American history has been this very, very uh, uh, well-calibrated separation. Now, a historian called Lawrence Moore wrote a great book recently called Selling God. And he doesn't mean that in a crass or commercial sense at all. He simply points out this fact. After the Revolution, because there was no established church, either in America or in any of the states, every religious organization which wanted to prosper had got to be able to make itself attractive on its own terms uh, in the free marketplace of religious ideas. Looking at it in the very simplest way, think about it this way. If a minister wanted to get paid, he had to attract a congregation. And if he couldn't get a congregation together, he wouldn't be able to stay in business. Uh, and, and, and therefore, all the different religious denominations thrived to the degree to which they could get a congregation. Now, of course, what that tended to mean was that the quality of the preaching was much, much higher, which it still is right up to the present, undoubtedly, but also that, to some extent, the preachers had to modify the message to suit the congregation they were trying to attract. If a minister was going to preach something which the congregation wouldn't accept, the congregation would stop coming, because there's no form of coercion involved here. It's entirely voluntary. And it's interesting to see how, in the 19th century, the theology itself starts to shift. One of the things that happened in the 19th century was the gradual disappearance of predestinarian Calvinism, the idea that before you're even born, God has already assigned your soul to heaven or hell, and that there's nothing you can do about it. This, this 
pitiless doctrine which was so dominant in the early part of the Reformation and in the American, the New England colonies. You can actually see it happening in, within one family, the Beecher family. Early in the 19th century, Lyman Beecher was probably the, the best known preacher in America. And he was a, a, a traditional Calvinist. His daughter, Catherine, was engaged to be married to a man called Alexander Fisher. Now, Alexander Fisher was a professor of mathematics at Harvard. But unfortunately, Alexander Fisher was drowned in a shipwreck. And the letter which Lyman Beecher wrote to his daughter to tell her about her fiancé's death is an absolute monument of religious heartlessness. It says something to this effect. Uh, Dear Catherine, I'm sorry to tell you that Alexander Fisher has been drowned and his soul is condemned to eternal torment in the fires of hell. Because he, we've got no evidence that he went through a conversion experience and so he's lost and damned forever. Now, Catherine Beecher was traumatized by this and never really recovered. She never married, but she did become a, a very um, fluent writer. So did her sister Harriet Beecher Stowe, who wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin, one of the great sentimental religious novels of the middle of the 19th century. And Catherine and Harriet's brother, Henry Ward Beecher, who by the 1860s and 70s was probably the most famous preacher in America. But if you look at his theology, the, the harsh and pitiless predestinarian Calvinism has disappeared almost completely, and it's been replaced by a sentimental religion of Jesus. Another change in 19th century American theology is the development of, the, of an interest in Jesus as a personality. Before 1800, you hardly ever come across much discussion of Jesus except in the matter of the resurrection and the atonement. But in the 19th century, especially after about the 1830s, people began writing biographies of Jesus and saying, what was he like as a person? That's what we want. We want Jesus the friendly person. And Jesus becomes a much more friendly fellow than he ever had been previously. Uh, I don't know if you know the hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, but it was written in 1855, and uh, that's just exactly when you would expect it to have been written. When this idea starts to develop, Jesus is our friend. Yeah? The theology is changing. So hell is disappearing, predestination is disappearing, and this is coming in instead. All right, now, while this was going on in the 19th century, and while a religion was going from strength to strength with strong revivals and so on, in Britain it had already gone into a rather critical decline. Now, the thing about having an established church in Britain was this. It really encouraged hypocrisy. And hypocrisy, religious hypocrisy is very highly institutionalized in British life. You had to be a member of the Church of England if you wanted to be a member of Parliament, or a magistrate, or an army officer, or if you wanted to go to one of the great universities, Oxford or Cambridge. But already in the 1700s, it was becoming clear that many very talented people whose services the state needed were not members of the Church of England. They'd become Presbyterians, or Congregationalists, or Baptists, or Quakers. That is, they refused to conform to the established church. And the name for them in England is nonconformists. But on the other hand, the government very early on let it be known that if you were a Baptist and you were willing to go to the Anglican Communion service once a year, that would count. <laughs> There's actually a name for it, occasional conformity. <laughs> and it was an officially a recognized situation of occasional conformity. Uh, in fact, the Tory party was so indignant about it that in 1711 they passed a law trying to outlaw it. But as soon as the Whigs got back in power in 1719, they repealed the Occasional Conformity Act and the thing resumed. Yeah? And uh, the whole point about the Church of England was it wanted to be as broad as it possibly could be to keep as many people in as possible. You can believe almost anything doctrinally and still count as a member of the Church of England. And obviously there's some strength to that because it, it, it discourages religious intolerance, but it also means that the actual intellectual quality of the faith becomes very, very thin. Now, after the American Revolution, here's another point which is very important to grasp, and it doesn't come easily these days because of things which have happened since. After the American Revolution, the United States was the world's most revolutionary nation. It had done what lots of other nations wanted to do. Certainly, the revolutionaries of Latin America looked to the United States as an inspiring example and the Latin American revolutions were carried out in the early 19th century with the, with the model of the United States very much on the revolutionaries' minds. And similarly, people in Britain and, and the whole of continental Europe who wanted to have a one-man, one-vote democracy looked to America, the inspiring revolutionary example on the other side of the ocean. But there was a great difference because 
for the British radicals, as they understood it, the only, the only way they were going to be able to sweep away the, the old system, the bad old ways, was by getting rid not just of the class hierarchy, but also of the Church of England itself. And because of that, a militant secularist tradition began in Britain, and it's persisted right up to the present. And what I'd like to do now is tell you a little bit about the British secularist tradition. They, they regarded the church as tyrannical, as, as, as threatening and dominating, and as the enemy of freedom, and for that matter, the enemy of happiness. It had enormous economic power, because it imposed tithes. You had to pay a tenth of your pre-tax income to the church, whether you were a member of it or not. It had enormous psychological power because of its ability to threaten you with damnation. It had moral power because it was able to organize legislation relating to what was and was not permitted in the moral environment. And it had police power. Right into the 1860s, you could still be sent to prison in Britain for blasphemy or heresy. Now, what that meant was that if you wanted to... Um, radicalized British society, the Church of England was one of the biggest obstacles standing in your way. So no wonder that the key for secularists was to break its grip on the, on the economy and on morality and on consciences. One of the most interesting early figures in this tradition is John Stuart Mill, and I'm sure you all know something about him. He lived from 1806 to 1873. And he's one of the utilitarians. Now, the utilitarians are a very this-worldly political movement whose view was society ought to be organized so in the interest of the greatest happiness of the greatest number of people. Yeah? It's a very, very pragmatic, this-worldly kind of consideration. And uh, John Stuart Mill was very unusual in that he never had a religious upbringing that he had to break away from. He was uh, an atheist right from the beginning. His father had become convinced of the falseness of Christianity and brought up his son. He and Jeremy Bentham had long discussions about this. They kind of, they turned poor old John Stuart Mill into a sort of experiment. Um, they also said, such a lot of time gets wasted in education. Let's not do that. Let's educate him intensely right from the beginning. And so in, when you read John Stuart Mill's autobiography, he says, I began studying Greek when I was three, and I read most of the Greek classics by the time I was seven, at which point I then began studying Latin. So that, and when I was 10, I'd really read all of the, the, the classical repertoire. Then I began studying philosophy, and I was already quite fluent in German. And it's, it's absolutely incredible, you know, his achievements by the time he was 12. He was a real astonishing childhood prodigy. Oh, and to make matters worse, he'd, he'd have to learn his Greek lesson and recite it to his father. And when he was six, his father then set him the task of teaching his four-year-old sister the, le the lesson that he just <laughs> learned and recited. So John Stuart Mill has a very, very unusual childhood, to say the least. But here we are. Here's his description of religion in the, fa in the household. My father's rejection of all that is called religious belief was not, as many might suppose, primarily a matter of logic and evidence. The grounds of it were moral, still more than intellectual. He found it impossible to believe that a world so full of evil was the work of an author combining infinite power with perfect goodness and righteousness. His intellect spurned the subtleties by which men attempt to blind themselves to this open contradiction. He looked upon religion as the greatest enemy of morality, first by setting up fictitious excellences, beliefs in creeds, devotional feelings, and ceremonies not connected with the good of humanity, and causing these to be accepted as substitutes for genuine virtues. But above all, by radically vitiating the standard of morals, making it consist in doing the will of a being, on whom it lavishes indeed all the phrases of adulation, but whom in sober truth it depicts as eminently hateful. Now, later in the book, he admits that the utilitarians, although they were dedicated to um, the broadcasting of happiness, were themselves a rather grim and humorless crowd. And he says, it's true, there wasn't very much fun among the utilitarians. And then he has a very interesting meditation on happiness itself, which is relevant here. He says, I never wavered in the conviction that happiness is the test of all rules of conduct and the end of life. But I now thought that this end was only to be attained by not making it the direct end. Those only are happy, thought I, who have their minds fixed on some object other than their own happiness, on the happiness of others, on the improvement of mankind, even on some art or pursuit, followed not as a means, but as, an its, but as itself an ideal end. Aiming thus at something else, they find happiness by the way.' 
The enjoyments of life are sufficient to make it a pleasant thing when they are taken in passing without being made its principal object. Once make them so, and they are immediately felt to be insufficient. Ask yourself whether you are happy, and you cease to be so. That's interesting, isn't it? This idea that you've got to come at happiness indirectly rather than straight on. Now, later on in the book, he says he was working very hard. He was the first person to introduce in Parliament the concept of votes for women and a whole array of democratizing reforms in British life. But one day, he suddenly said to himself, if all the reforms I'm working for suddenly came true, would I be happy? And he realized, no, no, I wouldn't. And then he had a nervous breakdown. Uh, so, <laughs> So he has a very, very complicated relationship with uh, the nature of happiness and the nature of progress and so on. But it's a totally absorbing and fascinating figure. Now, another one from about 40 years later is a man called Edmund Goss. And I'd like to say a word now about Edmund Goss, who's one of my very favorite uh, Victorian Britons. He was the son of a scientist called Philip Goss. And Philip Goss was a highly talented scient uh, scientist and scientific illustrator who'd actually identified many small marine creatures and done very, very accurate drawings of them in the days before scientific photography was possible. He was uh, highly respected in the scientific community. And when in 1859, Charles Darwin published On the Origin of Species by Natural Selection, uh, Edmund Goss, the son, was just seven years old, so he witnessed his father's response to the publication of this book, which obviously has profound consequences for history from then on. And Philip Goss's reaction to the book was to say to Darwin, it's an incredible achievement. It's a very, very ingenious way of dealing with so much evidence that we've got in the world. But of course, it can't be true because it contradicts Genesis. And Genesis isn't just a book by some people. It's God's revealed word, word which is absolutely true, all of it. That is, Philip Goss, in addition to his scientific work, was a member of what we call a fundamentalist church, the Plymouth Brethren. And his view was, God's word can't be wrong. And you can't take part of it. You've got to take all of it. And the result is that, he, that Philip Goss gradually became a more and more marginal figure inside the British scientific community as, bit by bit, it all went over to the Darwinian way of looking at the evidence, which was so persuasive. In fact, Philip Goss, the father, wrote a book called Omphalos. And Omphalos is the word for your navel, your belly button. And he says, listen, Adam and Eve were made in God's image. Does that mean that they had belly buttons? Yes. Yes, it does. But they weren't actually born, which means they didn't really need them in the way that each subsequent born person needed them. So what God did was to put them down on earth as though they were part of a longer tradition of births. And in the same way, isn't it reasonable to assume that things like the fossil record give the impression to scientists that we've got a much older earth, even though, in fact, of course, we haven't. Now, uh, the reviewers lampooned this book and said, oh, I see, so he's telling us that God hid the fossils in the rocks to confuse us. And it's true that when you read Omphalos, unless you're a very, very sympathetic reader, it does kind of come out that way. Now, Philip Goss also believed that he was in direct communication with God. Oh, incidentally, his wife, Edmund's mother, had died, and so father and son are living together, and the book is about the relationship between the two of them. It's a heartbreakingly beautiful book. And uh, if Edmund wanted to do something which was fun, his father would always say, will pray over it. So they'd fall to their knees on the hard stone floor. And after a minute, the father would say, God has told me that you mustn't do this. <laughs> but of course, it isn't long before young Edmund gets onto the uh, same wavelength. So at one point, he's invited to a, another little girl's birthday party in the neighborhood. And he says, Father, do you, do you think I could go to, to so-and-so's birthday party? And, and the father says, we should pray. So they fall to their knees. And, and just before he knows his father's going to rise up, little Edmund rises up and says, God says I can go to the party. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, the father's, the father's much too um, uh, respectful of his son to say, no, no, God sent me a different message. So then the son does go to the party. But when he gets there, it isn't all that much fun because uh, one by one, the, the, the birthday girl's mother says to all the kids at the party, what can you know? Show us your party trick. And you know, one girl plays the piano and one dances a few steps. And she says, Edmund, can you recite a poem to us? And Edmund can, but the only poems he knows are written by the graveyard poets. These gloomy 18th century poems, which are all about how we're dust and we'll return to dust and we'll decay and so on. And so after a line or two, the mother says, Oh, thank you, Edmund, that's plenty. <laughs> uh, anyway, fantastic book. Now, as the. Uh, as the son grows up, as Edmund grows older, 
he loses the faith. Although he's, you know, he, he kind of, by, by an act of will, he tries to remain part of this, of this organization, and he just can't do it. And, it's, and, and the, the relationship between father and son is poisoned by the father's knowledge that his son is drifting away. And the father's convinced that this means his son's damnation. Now, here's what Edmund himself says at the end of the book about it. Um, oh, no, sorry, wrong one. And now there first occurred to me the reflection which in years to come I was to repeat over and over with an ever sadder emphasis. What a charming companion, what a delightful parent, what a courteous and engaging friend my father would have been and would preeminently have been to me if it had not been for this stringent piety which ruined it all. After my long experience, I have surely the right to protest against the untruth that evangelical religion, or any religion in a violent form, is a wholesome or valuable or desirable adjunct to human life. It divides heart from heart. It sets up a vain chimerical ideal in the barren pursuit of which all the tender, indulgent affections, all the genial play of life, all the exquisite pleasures and soft resignations of the body, all that enlarges and calms the soul, are exchanged for what is harsh and void and negative. It encourages a stern and ignorant spirit of condemnation. It throws altogether out of gear the healthy movement of the conscience. It invents virtues which are sterile and cruel. It invents sins which are no sins at all, but which darken the heaven of innocent joy with futile clouds of remorse. There is something horrible, if we will bring ourselves to face it, in the fanaticism that can do nothing with this pathetic and fugitive existence of ours, but treat it as if it were the uncomfortable antechamber to a palace which no one has explored and of the plan of which we know absolutely nothing. Isn't that a, a, a poignant passage about the way in which the, the religiosity destroyed the relationship between them? Well, now... In the mid-19th century, in Britain, secularism was a highly organized business. Uh, the National Secular Society was established in 1866, and it almost became something like a church of its own. It had services and rituals where religion was routinely denounced. Very, very busy publishing business and so on. And uh, regularly, the secularist writers and speakers who were touring throughout the kingdom and often uh, debating with members of the, uh, of the clergy emphasized the moral superiority of secularism. Here's another one. This is Robert Cooper, who is the editor of one of the secular journals. And he says, in the gospel genealogy of Christ, only four women were mentioned. Quote, Tamar, who seduced the father of her late husband. Rachel, a common prostitute. Ruth, who, instead of marrying one of her cousins, went to bed with another of them. And Bathsheba, an adulteress, who espoused David, the murderer of her first husband. In other words, if you're looking for moral improvement, the first thing you've got to do is to get rid of this tawdry religiosity. We're the moral ones. We've got a moral superiority which the religious people can't match. Now, the most famous of all these secularists was a man called Charles Bradlaugh, uh, a, a spellbinding, iconoclastic speaker. Eventually, he was, uh, he, and he was popular too, he was elected to Parliament in the 1860s, and uh, one of the things he advocated was the abolition of the monarchy. He was an English Republican. Now, in 1861, Queen Victoria's husband, Prince Albert, died, and the Queen went into profound seclusion. She wouldn't even perform her state duties. And briefly, the Republican movement in England was very popular. The possibility of actually abolishing the monarchy seemed realistic. But it's very difficult for Charles Bradlaugh even to take his seat in Parliament because to do so you have to swear an oath, an oath, uh, a, a divine oath to uphold the British Constitution. And he said, I can't take a religious oath because I'm an atheist. To which Parliament said, well, in that case, you can't take your seat. So they held another by-election in the constituency and he won again. And Parliament again refused to seat him. Then he won it again. You know, the constituency itself was up in arms about this on behalf of the secularist. I think it's very difficult to imagine, isn't it, an American politician who was an emphatic atheist winning repeated elections. And finally, Bradlaugh got his way and Parliament changed the rules. In fact, he, he presided over the Oaths Act of 1888 to say, you no longer have to, uh, to swear an oath. It's sufficient simply to uh, affirm that you'll uphold the British Constitution. And, uh, and the, the, uh, the Bradlaugh case caused, it caused big news all over Britain, and George Bernard Shaw and many other famous people in British life wrote in support of him. Let me just tell you about one more of these uh, 
wonderful English writers in the secular tradition. This is Bertrand Russell, who was born in 1872 and lived right through into the 1960s, one of the best-known atheists of 20th century Britain. He, he was, his, his grandfather had been Prime Minister, Lord John Russell, and the family knew everybody. They were friends with Gladstone, and they were connected to all the high people in the liberal tradition, and they knew the great artists, and so on. But they were also conventional members of the Church of England. And when, as a teenager, young Bertrand began to have doubts, the family were... Uh, scornful of his deviation. He says, It appeared to me obvious that the happiness of mankind should be the aim of all action, and I discovered to my surprise that there were those who thought otherwise. Belief in happiness, I found, was called utilitarianism, and was merely one among a number of possible ethical theories. I adhered to it after this discovery, Anyway, his relatives are horrified by this. Oh, no, you don't want to be a utilitarian. And then he says, what I'm really hoping to be for my career is to be a philosopher. And he tells his, grand his parents had died. He tells his grandmother about this, who's, who looks after him. And she says, this is how she sums up philosophy. What is mind? No matter. What is matter? Never mind. <laughs> so she sort of jokes that. Anyway, Bertrand doesn't give up, but he withdraws into complete silence about it from then on. Much later, in 1927, he gave a talk called Why I Am Not a Christian, and this became a 20th century classic of the atheist tradition. Uh, and here's what he says, I'm, I'm not a Christian because Christianity is the enemy of happiness. Quote, there are a great many ways in which the church, by its insistence upon what it chooses to call morality, inflicts upon all sorts of people undeserved and unnecessary suffering. And of course, as we know, it is, in its major part, an opponent still of progress and improvement in all the ways that diminish suffering in the world, because it has chosen to label as morality a certain narrow set of rules of conduct which have nothing to do with human happiness. And when you say this or that ought to be done because it would make for human happiness, they think that's got nothing to do with the matter at all. What? Human happiness to do with morals? The object of morals is not to make you happy? <laughs> so he says... Anyway, it goes on right up to the present. I mean, the most recent example of it that I can think of is a book which was just published a year or two ago by Christopher Hitchens called God is Not Great. Some of you might have, have, uh, have heard him or know about it. And uh, Christopher Hitchens, it's a ranting diatribe against religion. He hasn't got a kind word for it under any circumstances. He detests Mother Teresa. Uh, and he's written a book-length book denunciation of, of her called The Missionary Position. Uh, and every few pages in um, God is Not Great, in italics comes the phrase, religion poisons everything. Now, as you know, in, uh, in America, particularly since 9-11, one of the conventions which has grown up is to make a very, very sharp separation between radical Islamism on the one hand and, um, and, and, and Islam, the, the Muslim faith in general, as one of the, the, the traditional religions of peace. Yeah, this sharp distinction, which I'm sure most of us uh, honor. But he won't do that. He says, no, no, Islam's a religion, and religion poisons everything. And some of the most bristling pages of this book are his absolute slashing attacks upon Islam itself. He was also a friend of Salman Rushdie and bitterly resented the fatwa which had been issued against Rushdie a few years previously. Um, now, here's another thing to think about. By the 20th century... Uh, religiosity in America was still extremely widespread, and lots and lots of very, very interesting Americans were famous in the 20th century for being religious. Amy Semple McPherson, Billy Sunday, uh, Billy Graham, Pat Robertson, Jerry Falwell, a long tradition of, uh, um, William Jennings Bryan, a long tradition of them. And in the Catholic tradition too, Dorothy Day and Thomas Merton, in the, in the mainstream Protestant line, people like Reinhold Niebuhr, lots and lots of people in America were famous for being religious. But when you, when you try to think, okay, who are the famous Brits of the 20th century who are famous for being religious? It's very hard to think of any. I think there's one, C.S. Lewis. And even he's more famous for writing The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe than he is for his religious apologetics. However, Lewis is himself a very interesting person to set against or side by side with these people I've been mentioning because he also is interested in happiness. His religious autobiography is called Surprised by Joy. And again, it's a wonderful book which I, I counsel you very strongly to, to read. And he says, um, he, talking about his early childhood, he says that they, he'd suddenly have moments of intense, overwhelming happiness, a feeling of, of acute joy which was, uh, was 
blissful in its intensity, but which went away almost as soon as it had happened. He couldn't hold on to it. No sooner had the moment come that it was gone, and he's vainly striving to get it back again. Uh, here's how he describes it. It's difficult to find words strong enough for the sensation which came over me. Milton's The Enormous Bliss of Eden, giving the full ancient meaning to enormous, comes somewhere near it. It was a sensation, of course, of desire. But desire for what? Before I knew what I desired, the desire itself was gone. The whole glimpse withdrawn. The world turned commonplace again, or only stirred by a longing for the longing that had just ceased. It had only taken a moment of time, and in a certain sense, everything else that had ever happened to me was insignificant by comparison. A few years later, it happens to him again. And incidentally, it happens in very ordinary circumstances. This is when he's reading Beatrix Potter's book about Squirrel Nutkin. No, it's not as though he's in some religiously elevated state. It suddenly happens again. And he says, um, I realized it was something quite different from ordinary life, and even from ordinary pleasure, something, as they would now say, in another dimension. I call it joy, which here is a technical term that should be distinguished from happiness and pleasure. Joy, in my sense, has indeed one characteristic and only one. The fact that anyone who's experienced it will want it again. Apart from that, and considered only in its quality, it might almost equally well be called a particular kind of unhappiness or grief. But then, it is a kind we want. I doubt whether anyone who has ever tasted it would ever, if both were in his power, exchange it for all the pleasures in the world. But then, joy is never in our power, and pleasure often is. As the book goes on, he talks about the gradual decline of his faith, very much along the same kind of lines as we've heard of from Goss and from Russell, that gradually his education is squeezing the religion out of him. But then it takes a sudden turn, which the others didn't take. When he's reading a book called Fantasts by George MacDonald as an 18-year-old student, the feeling recurs, this wonderful, joyful feeling. And this time it stays with him for the first time. He says, I did not yet know and I was long in learning the name of the new quality, this bright shadow that rested on the tail. I do now. It was holiness. It was as though the voice that had called to me from the world's end were now speaking at my side. It was with me in the room or in my own body. If it had once eluded me by its distance, it now eluded me by its proximity, something too near to see, too plain to be understood on this side of knowledge. In the depths of my disgrace, in the then invincible ignorance of my intellect, all this was given to me without asking, even without consent. That night, my imagination was, in a certain sense, baptized. The rest of me, not unnaturally, took longer. And then the rest of the book goes on to describe the way in which, gradually, from this uh, overwhelming experience of holiness, he recovers and intensifies a, a Christian faith, uh, which, which stays with him for the rest of his life. But it's very, very unusual in 20th century Britain. Very common in the United States, very rare in, in Britain. Now, this doesn't lead me to say that um, you know, Britain equals atheism and the United States equals religion. It's clearly not that simple. And I should say that there are some interesting atheists or, or religious skeptics in America as well. Mark Twain, all through his stories, are littered uh, remarks uh, denouncing the, the hypocrisy of organized religion. Or H.L. Mencken. Mencken made this funny remark. Um, Puritans are people who are afraid that someone somewhere is happy. <laughs> but, but what's interesting about American secularism is it's far less organized. You don't have the same sense of a concentrated assault. And that's partly because there isn't something to, for the assault to be launched against. There isn't an establishment in the same way. To British people, many issues in American politics seem baffling. Prayer in the schools, government aid to religious school, religious uh, tax exemption, abortion. And the reason these things aren't controversial in Britain is simply because the big religious constituency, which is so energetic in American politics, is simply missing altogether. They're just not there. Anyway, I'd like to end with a, 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 a return to the paradox. The fact that happiness is a very difficult thing to describe, and it's certainly an impossible thing to measure. The evidence from the people I've quoted to you suggests that the pursuit of happiness nearly always actually means the pursuit of something else. And I think that's a nice ambiguity to end with. So thanks very much indeed. Thank you.
Thank you, Professor Allett, for your sterling remarks and very provocative uh, introduction of the critical element that we have sort of not heard so much in the presentations to date, uh, taking seriously the critical voices against religion, thinking about religion as an impediment to happiness, and then thinking creatively about, well, is there alternative ways to conjure up uh, the American history, the British history we heard, and to engage in a continued conversation about this. We can walk away as this is a council of despair, and the conference we have coming up on the pursuit of happiness and interreligious perspective is simply a nice final gasp of religiosity before happiness is finally attained, or this can be viewed as a very provocative and powerful challenge for us to begin to think about uh, what organized religion, what institutionalized religion, what certain doctrinal statements uh, can do to a person, to a group, to a society, indeed to a nation, as it contemplates the understanding of the pursuit of happiness. Professor Allett has given us much to think about, and I would like to begin the conversation with him by inviting you to come to the um, two microphones in the middle of the room, or if you're trapped in the middle of a row, to signal us that we can bring a microphone to you, and to put some questions to Professor Allett to continue the conversation on which he has so eminently embarked us. Please, questions. I have a comment and a question. I'm Andy Namius. I'm a professor of pediatrics, public health. And uh, my comment, you just gave me the entree to something that I happen to have. And that is that uh, pursuit of happiness always requires, is, uh, requires other things. There's an exception. And as a physician, I, I, a pediatrician, I wrote about 10 years ago in the academic exchange the omission, a vital omission, of health. Now, why didn't Jefferson add health? Well, medicine was not so hot at those days. But what I wrote uh, recently, um, something that will appear in the academic exchange next month, is uh, that Jefferson actually changed his mind about the relation of happiness and health possibly because of his wife having died a few years earlier with a chronic illness. And if I may, I happen to have uh, sent this today. Um, he wrote, Jefferson wrote to his relative, T.M. Randolph, Jr., the following, I quote, with your talents and industry, with science and the steadfast honesty, which eternally pursues right regardless of consequences, you may promise yourself everything but health, without which there is no happiness, and attention to health then should take place of every other object. So uh, my question to you is, uh, particularly since you're British and you've had a health system that's national and we've, <laughs> we've, uh, we've struggled with this over a century or so, the last two years, if people, maybe you know this quotation of Jefferson, it's published in 1904 um, in a series of letters. So uh, would things possibly have differed? Here's the man who wrote the declaration, now seems to say that there is no happiness without health, as I read it, and that's my question to you. Also, incidentally, may I point out as a physician that we do have a medical history society that will have its meeting and, and the lectures on Saturday morning at the School of Public uh, of Medicine, School of Medicine, Saturday morning. Whether Jefferson's mentioning of health in the uh, enumeration of unalienable rights in the Declaration would have had any difference to American, to American history is unlikely. The, the Declaration itself doesn't have any uh, juridical binding power. In other words, the Constitution is an actual uh, document with legal uh, effect in a way that the Declaration is not. But it's interesting, I think, to think about health. Had that been included in the list of unalienable rights, it would have seemed even more extraordinary, wouldn't it? I mean, as I said to you, my first um, re reaction on reading the Declaration was simply of thinking, it's not true. These aren't actually self-evident rights at all. And to claim that there's an unalienable right to health, how could we possibly claim it 
Uh, there's, there's, Well, actually, there's a, there's, a, there's a very long religious tradition of believing that suffering and sanctity are very closely allied. Now, it's true that the people in the secular tradition see that as a kind of perversion. But uh, certainly the idea is very, very strong in the Catholic tradition that people who suffer are closer to God because of it, because in a small way they're undergoing the kind of pain that Jesus felt during the crucifixion. I have a friend called Robert Orsi who's a, a great religious historian, and he, he remembers growing up with an aunt who was crippled, as the, you know, the word is used in those days. And he later wrote an article about it called, um, Grandma, is it fun to be a cripple? Because people, people were so, um, said, to, said to Grandma, you're so lucky to suffer in this way. Yeah? Your suffering gives you a, a spiritual power. Oh, I'm, I'm not coming out in favor of suffering. You know? and I, I mean... <laughs> I'm simply alerting you to the fact that it's a very, very complicated question and that happiness and the pursuit of happiness has clearly meant very, very different kinds of things to different people. And I dare say that any two people here, if we were to challenge them as to what happiness is, would give us very different answers. So, go ahead. All right. Um, what do you think, do you think that the uncertainty about what pursuit of happiness meant could have led to the drafters of the Constitution write that government shall neither establish a religion nor prohibit the free exercise thereof, because those two, those two clauses can be uh, conflicting. And do you think that, that the conflicting idea about what pursuit of happiness is led the framers to put both clauses into the Constitution? Um, not directly, no, because the Declaration was, was written in 1776 and the Constitution not until um, 1788, uh, so a long, or 1787, I guess, uh, so not until quite a long time afterwards. And even then, the First Amendment, of, of which that's a part, wasn't enacted until 1791, uh, and, and it was part of the quid pro quo for getting all the states to accept the Constitution that there should be these uh, limitations on federal power. Uh, here, but here's the relevant point there. I think most of us here today would regard religious freedom as a positive good. We're glad that we've got it. I mean, one thing that sometimes happens when I'm teaching religious history is I'll say to a student in my class, uh, what religion are you? And the kid will say, no, I'm Methodist. And I say, all right, tell us why the Methodists are right and everybody else is wrong. And the kid absolutely refuses to do it. And the reason they refuse to do it is because they know it's an act of very bad manners. Yeah? One of the things you mustn't do Unless perhaps you're a Jehovah's Witness, then perhaps you would do it. But <laughs> overwhelmingly, the majority of people in America accept the idea that you take seriously your own religion, but only in such a way as to be able to accommodate all the others. In other words, we now regard religious freedom as a positive good. But I think at the time, in the 1770s and 80s, it was regarded as a necessary concession to the fact that otherwise there was going to be no, uh, no peace. Although Jefferson himself was very, very enthusiastic about religious freedom. One of the things he was most proud of in his entire life was his shepherding the religious freedom statute through the Virginia legislature. So there's not a direct correlation, but there's a, there's a linkage. Uh, sir, go ahead. Uh, yes, sir. I, I grew up in an Islamic world, so um, uh, I see the same issue as religion uh, about the happiness, really. Uh, I see it as a poison that is, uh, has corrupted the human mind, which uh, human beings are created this to cover up their own unhappiness. And they have, we have created meanings for happiness with our own definitions, which those definitions have directed us in a direction that is really as uh, more unhappy and more in conflict, more in uh, disarray, in the whole societies are a mess. And so, we have to really educate ourselves to read what is the true meaning of the word happiness. And we have defined it happiness as an achievement. And that is not happiness. If it was, the, the, a lot of rich people would be happy. They are not. So, uh, the, but what I find uh, interesting from the first phrase that you said, self-evident truth and God is, you know, given, you know, whatever. It, it seemed that uh, it came uh, clear to me uh, that Self and the God for the, uh, the, uh, the creators of Constitution was same meaning. The self is creating the truth and the God and pursuing the happiness through the self. 
So what is your observation on that? Well, I, I come straight back to the remark I made in quoting um, John Stuart Mill and C.S. Lewis. Happiness isn't something which can possibly be defined. It isn't as though any amount of study of the question would bring us to a working definition of happiness, or at least, if it did, it would be an arid, academic, technical concept which had no bearing on our actual lives. I think Mill got it absolutely right. It's, when, it's by doing other things, and by doing them well, and by feeling a sense of, of purposefulness in doing them, that we become happy. But that we, what we can't possibly do is say, my objective now is to become happy. Yeah? That to do that, I mean, there's a name for it, isn't there? Um, hedonism, I suppose. Yeah? The pursuit of pleasure or, 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 or sybaritism, the vain attempt to become happy just for its own sake. And it's the kind of thing, if you're watching a Bud Light commercial, yeah, <laughs> you, can, you can sustain this idea for about 10 seconds. You know, you have the, you have the delightfully beautiful young people dancing on the beach. And, it, and, and for, for a few seconds, you think, oh, yes, there it is, happiness. But, luck, but then the commercial ends. And if it, if it went on, you know, the time would come and they'd think, oh, you know, our car's been towed. Oh, you know. My... <laughs> <laughs> All right, enough of that. Uh, but, yes, my, my answer is happiness itself is a delightful, it's a delicious but infuriating thing because it won't submit itself to a definition. I enjoyed your talk. Thanks a lot. I had a question about C.S. Lewis. Um, you, you were mentioning that he was kind of unique, at least in, in England or Britain, as, as, as an example of a person who was very religious, but also very famous, educated, a scholar, a respected literary figure. And I was wondering, is that unique? Because I thought that was striking. I never thought about it that way before. And is it unique as compared to other educated Brits or to the British? You know, would you imagine as Britain as a whole would be more secular or is it just more if you compare him to his peers in the, in the literary community? And kind of as a follow-up, uh, you, you kind of mentioned that he seemed to, re to either retain or regain his religious feelings almost in spite of his education. Did he get, was he being a rebel? I mean, was it a way to be, I mean, is there any evidence that that's what he was doing? Or was it really kind of more of a, I mean, and obviously I don't want to bag on C.S. Lewis's, you know, but it, it, you know, it, did he ever talk about how he came about that? Was it an epiphany like the feelings of joy? Or did he actually reason his way back back to religion, and I just would be curious about... Right. And to answer the second half first, the feelings came first, and then, the, and then he kind of read his way back into it. He was a voracious reader. But having had this intense feeling, and, the, and, and eventually the conviction that it was holiness, that it was a, God's way of speaking through his emotions, he became convinced of the reality of God, and then he started to read in the, the theological tradition with a new sympathy and a new respect. And his faith, be, although he never, he never tried to... to uh, brush aside the complexities and the difficulties which religion confronts us with, uh, he, he felt it to be overwhelmingly true. But he, he certainly wasn't the kind of personality who did it defiantly. Uh, not at all. He wasn't a, a cantankerous person at all. On the other point, uh, yeah, Amer Britain is a far, far, far less religious place than the United States. Uh, earlier we had a dinner with, with a group of the fellows of the center here, but let me tell you the same story to give you a feeling about this. I grew up in a family where my father was an atheist, uh, he was a high school physics teacher, and he was a principled atheist, and my mother was a member of the Church of England. Now before my brother and sister and I were born, uh, my parents made an agreement that my mother would take us to church, and that my father wouldn't talk it down at home. Yeah? And that when we came of age, we'd decide for ourselves. But my mother would sometimes bring home from the, from the church service in the morning uh, some of her friends to have coffee and to chat about the service. And I remember so clearly when I was 10 or 11, my dad said to one of these ladies, uh, now, Daphne, tell me what the sermon was about. To which Daphne's answer was, oh, Eric, I don't know. In a tone of voice which implied, not only was I not listening, you know perfectly well that I wasn't listening. <laughs> and, and it's like, uh, and it's unreasonable of you to act as though you think I might have been listening. Because, after all, it was a Church of England sermon. The last thing anyone does with those things is listen to them. <laughs> the level of preaching was, in fact, very, very bad. Uh, and, and religious life had become almost solely a set of rituals about which there didn't seem to be any serious thinking. That's why, to me, it was so fascinating to come to the United States. 
and to find people who are intensely serious about religiosity. Because the image of America that you have growing up in Britain is of a place which is very rich and very violent, because we see all the movies and the westerns and so on, but not a place which is saturated with religiosity. That's something I simply didn't know about until I actually uh, arrived here on, on American shores. So. Um, when I was in, in middle school and, and going through uh, church confirmation, uh, we were taught the catechism, and, and the, the, thing, the, the first question was, what is man's chief end? And man's chief end was uh, to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Uh, and, and it sounds a lot like, uh, like happiness. And, and I think I'd like to challenge that, that notion that uh, if you were to take the, the story of creation uh, as the truth, uh, that, uh, that life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness is, is not self-evident. I, I believe that they, they are self-evident, uh, if, if God gave us life, he, he, gave us, he gave Adam and Eve enough liberty, enough rope to hang himself with, I guess. Um, and uh, it, was, it was a place to be happy, uh, but um, as, as you mentioned, Milton's, uh, uh, what was it called? The, the Bliss of Eden. Yes. Um, but I, I guess... Um, uh, what, I think what you said at the end was, was exactly right. Um, we, we don't pursue happiness. We pursue what we, we think will make us happy. Uh, but I was just wanting to comment on that and, and challenge that notion. Well, I'm a historian, and the great thing about being a historian is that you don't have to have an opinion about these things. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, it's almost always a good idea not to have an opinion. My job is to say to you, here's what the religious people said, and here's what the secularists said, and here's why they said it. And, uh, and of course, what strikes me so strongly is the fact that Everyone I quoted from this evening was being absolutely sincere. Yeah? John Stuart Mill and Edmund Goss and Bertrand Russell and C.S. Lewis were all dead serious. In other words, the question of whether you find religion liberating and, and a source of happiness, clearly, overwhelmingly, for, for many people it has been in, in many, many uh, societies and cultures throughout history. But clearly there are other people who have found it to be, have experienced it to be, repressive and dogmatic and intolerant and, and crushing out the spirit of life. Yeah, we can't possibly claim, or I certainly can't claim to say, here's the truth of the matter. Just as happiness is itself a, a vague term, in a, in a, in a sense the, the consequences of religion are vague. I appeal to you to read William James's book, The Variety of Religious Experience, because there William James says, take them on their merits, see what people actually did with the religion they'd got. That's the way, that's the criterion for judgment. Sir. I also grew up in England in the 1960s. My father was an atheist. My mother, a member of the Church of England. Um, I had a question about a comment you made about the role of the church in England in, I think you said, the 18th century. And correct me on the term you used, but it was something like institutionalized tyranny or institutionalized hypocrisy in the sense that anyone who wanted to achieve anything in public life had to be at least uh, an occasional some sort, conformist. Some sort of member, yeah? Yes. Wouldn't it be true to say that the same is true in the United States today? in the sense that no one could, no one is likely to achieve any sort of national or public major office unless, if they're an atheist for instance, unless they at least have some sort of stamp of religion on them. So whatever your term was, whether it was institutionalized hypocrisy or institutionalized tyranny, I can't remember which, wouldn't it be true to apply the same to American society today? That's a very good point and I agree with you that it's hard to imagine a successful political candidate who declared him, herself or her, herself to be an atheist. Yes, it's clearly good politics to be seen to be going to church, uh, and at the same time to be seen to be going to a church which isn't too fervent. You know, there's a certain range of them. Eisenhower said this, didn't he? Somehow, um, it's, it's something to the effect of, it's a good thing that we all believe in a supreme being, but I don't care which one. Yeah. In other words, it's a matter of ultimate importance, but also sort of we'll bracket that to one side. Uh, Alexis de Tocqueville, back in the 1830s, when he came to America, a French nobleman in investigating American society said, it's absolutely incredible here in America, all these different churches. You'd think the place would be chaotic, but actually what they all do is turn out citizens who are very, very similar to each other. Uh, and they all have the virtue of Christian citizenship, and somehow the Republic holds together incredibly well, with religion being a binding force, even though they're members of different religions. Yes, that's an interesting thing. When um, President Kennedy was being criticized for his uh, promiscuity, he said, I think it's very unfair for them to criticize me because I'm a Catholic, because I'm such a bad Catholic. You know? <laughs> I was off the record, of course. <laughs> um, well, perhaps that was a bit strong. 
Yes. Uh, I mean, obviously, w hypocrisy is a funny thing, isn't it? Actually, we couldn't possibly do without it. Uh, there, are, there are many areas of our lives, and it's extremely useful to tell white lies and to, and to compromise and to agree to differ and to act one way with the knowledge that really you think something else. In a way, that's what civility and manners are all about. And I suppose that most of those occasional conformists said to themselves, were, were able to reconcile it with their consciences because they said it, helped keeps, the, it keeps the peace it makes it more likely that we'll get on. It makes it more likely that later our group will be given concessions, uh, which proved to be true. So, yeah, my, 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 my noun was too harsh. Yeah. Yes, uh, I had a question about how some of the, the secular criticism has been applied. Um, a lot of the quotations and stuff that, that you had just read to us kind of focused on religion um, as it is as an institution, as an, as in religion and application. Um, my question is, if you take a look at many of the world religions as far as their, their goals and, and their ideal end, whether it's Christianity or Islam or, or world religions throughout, um, the goal is usually a good end or a positive end or in some cases a perfect end. Um, and my question is, the, is there an example from the secular literature about an attack on religion based on the end and not so much on the application? Well, there is in, I mean, one particular branch of, of secularism is, is the history of communism, where in effect what the, what, what, um, the, the Marxist or the communist Marxist tradition said was to set up a, a, a rival end, which was the, a, a, the complete accomplishment of socialism here on earth. Uh, and as you know, in, certainly in Stalinist Russia, it took on semi-religious overtones in which Stalin became something like a god. But of course, it was also horrifically repressive. Most secularists have taken the view, the whole point is that we should let people choose for themselves. The secularists haven't been people who've tried to uh, um, prohibit worship. They simply said, what we objected was being told that we're members of a state church automatically and that we've got to pay tithes for its upkeep. We take the view that people should be able to decide for themselves. And then they add that in their own judgment, the evidence for, uh, for the Judeo-Christian tradition is actually feeble evidence. But the, I think the distinction is the religions, as you say, the religions do tend to have an end, and secularism is partly a protest against the idea that there should be an end. Because in a society full of different people, we're going to want to pursue different ends. And in fact, for that matter, we're likely to be, to be happier if we are, in fact, pursuing different ends. Oh, I love pursuing different ends. Um, I, I've written a book about what the world would be like if, um, if we had an, a ratio of 90% women and 10% men. <laughs> and when The Pursuit of Happiness was penned, um, during about that time, uh, John and Abigail Adams discussed uh, the voting of women, and uh, he said that then women would have way too much power um, because they already have, they already wield more power than, you know, men do without the vote. So that's what he said anyway. But I'm, I'm wondering, uh, you know, you can't quantify or scientifically um, define happiness with any MRI, CAT scan, or anything like that, um, and you can't really say that someone is crying is unhappy because they might be happy with tears. And uh, so there, it, it's, it's quite um, complicated. But um, I, my question is, can you um, imagine the pursuit of happiness as uh, inspiring women and people of slavery and people um, who are downtrodden in any way. And you've mentioned quite a few um, philosophers, but there were so many philosophers who were only poets, and some of them were women. And I wish that that would be brought more into, you know, the, the dialogue, because, um, you know, I'm sure that there are quite a few men in the world who are much happier with, um, the strata of what it was like when it was pinned. If I'd had longer, I would have talked more about some of the other interests of these English secularists. One of them is that many of them were, in, were feminists. John Stuart Mill is a, obviously wrote the book on the subjection of women and was a pioneer advocate for votes for women. And in fact, believed that 
uh, he says in his autobiography, all the really good ideas in, in my books come from my wife, Harriet Taylor. He, he, was, he, he was in love with the lady next door, and for 20 years she was married to Mr. Taylor, and then finally he died and the two of them got married, and, and he, he attributes to her most of his great thoughts. But, but first he, and then a whole succession of these English secularists were very enthusiastic about contraception. And they said, contraceptives ought to be available to women because constant pregnancies make women miserable and break down their health and make them unhappy, whereas, the, whereas access to contraception would make them happy and enable them to control their own fertility. Uh, and th this is what Bertrand Russell is talking about, the false moral uh, standards that the church upholds. That's what he's referring to. The fact that pro the, 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 the prohibition on contraception was lobbied for very heavily by the church because it believed it was a violation of God's will. So there's actually quite an interesting feminist dimension to this history of secularism. And I wrote the book Fertile Prayers, Daily Fertile Prayers, and I'm quite aware of what is happening in China and India with a ratio of males and females. And that's one of the reasons why I came up with a book a few years ago um, and, and wrote it. But, and it's not published, so no one can read it. But, I have written fertile prayers, and, and for you to say that, you know, um, even today, people who have abortions, uh, many of them are forced upon them by parents and men. They would rather have the child, and uh, so we, we still live in a, a, a day where happiness is very difficult. And, and thank you for um, everything. I wish more women were asking questions. Sir. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, a, a lot of the people you quoted and a lot of the passages that you quoted were reflective of very negative experiences that were behind where they were, of religion as being very repressive, uh, very dark. I wonder to what extent, in, in your reading of these, the more militant secularists, to what extent do you find examples of ones who've had very good experiences of religion or take very seriously very good experiences of religion to the point where you, you get the sense that in their arguments for atheism, you get the sense there it's a hard argument for them to make, that they, they, they had a hard time coming to this point because they take it very seriously. In other words, to what degree do you find the more militant secularists where it doesn't seem like it's just a reaction against a bad version of something, but where they're actually engaging the best of something? Well, but I think that's a, that's a very, very good question, and it's a difficult one to answer. I think by the 19th century, it had become clear that, um, especially after, after Darwin's Origin of Species, it was clearly going to be difficult to make the claim that the existence of God could be proved or at least that it could be proved scientifically in the same way that you could prove the existence of um, mountain ranges and tides. In other words, some things clearly were susceptible to measurement and some clearly weren't. So what happens to religiosity in the English-speaking world in the 19th century is a move towards emotionalism, or what's one of the things that happens to it. Uh, in the end, the, the feeling has to be decisive. And the people who do continue to feel that God exists aren't going to be talked out of it by rational persuasion. And conversely, those who feel that God doesn't exist or who feel that the, that the church is, is repressive aren't going to have those feelings altered unless something else happens to them with it, which has got equal emotional power. See, uh, b before that, it had seemed reasonable to believe that um, uh, rational study of the natural world would have the effect of making God's presence more and more obvious. And that's a point which breaks down by the 1850s irrevocably. Even, even though Jefferson was in some ways a religious skeptic, um, he nevertheless clearly did believe in a creator God, and he did believe in things like, well, in, fact, in, in, in notes in the state of Virginia, Jefferson says at one point, some people say that extinctions happen, but they don't. God wouldn't bring a creature into existence and then cause it to go out of existence. What's the point of that? Now, Jefferson was a, probably the most highly educated person in America of his day, but he belonged to the very last generation who could believe, on the basis of a really good education, that extinction didn't happen. Because after that, they started finding the dinosaur skeletons and building up overwhelming evidence in support of the idea that extinction was actually a very important part of, of, of life. <laughs> 
Uh, yes. Uh, I wanted to ask a question. Uh, to what degree do you think the, the secular, British secular thinkers tied together this concept of secularism with this concept of individual freedoms? And did, in that, did they think that those two were, uh, you know, necessarily had to be together? Um, and I, to put that in context, I mean, I think there's a lot of examples. For instance, we have the Dalai Lama coming to speak later. It's an example of a religious leader who would be someone who has really been a, a a driving force for, uh, you know, against an, a somewhat oppressive government uh, that takes away a lot of individual freedoms. And I, I don't know to what degree that those two concepts are necessarily tied together. So I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that. Well, I think the decisive issue is the question of, of compulsion. Uh, as, long as, you're, as long as you've got religious freedom, it's much more difficult to make the objection. I mean, you'd have to be very fanatical indeed, wouldn't you, to say, not only am I not religious, but you can't be either. Yeah? And you see, if you were living in a world where there was a state church, where you were being told, you must be religious, on, I mean, if you go far enough back on pain of, of prosecution for heresy, and later on on pain of being fined for non-attendance at church, you'd yourself instantly develop uh, a fairly vigorous secular, secularist outlook, even if you were in fact religious. I mean, another interesting point here, which perhaps I, I should have mentioned earlier, is this. When the First Amendment was written, no, no group supported it more, more wholeheartedly than the Baptists. Because until then, the Baptists had often been uh, persecuted or ridiculed or marginalized or stoned, you know, when they showed up. They were delighted to have this kind of separation institutionalized. It certainly wasn't the case that the religious people were in favor of establishment and that the secularists were against it. On the, on the contrary, uh, lots of intensely religious people were in favor of the secularization of the Constitution and the American government because they believed, rightly as it turned out, that that would create a much better environment in which religion would flourish. we just do one more. Okay, go ahead. Well, Professor Allen, is it possible that in our pursuit of happiness, we've employed religion to overly analyze our deeds of the past and project ourselves into the future, whereas happiness may actually be locked in the moment, and we're forgetting the moment all the time? Well, we, we live in the moment. Uh, the, 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 thing about, the thing that's so great about history is that it's... it's it's looking at a world which is rich and full and dense, and it's full of actual people doing actual things, whereas the future is thin and weak and boring and dull because it hasn't happened yet. And, uh, and obviously the present is the kind of intersection between the two. You can, only be, you can only be happy in the present. But on the other hand, another of the fascinating characteristics of happiness is that it's possible to anticipate the possibility of future happiness and to, and to live in the hope that you'll achieve it. In fact, in a sense, we do that all the time, don't we? Hope is really the anticipation of happiness, I suppose. And it's obviously an immensely powerful motive driving us on. Anyone who's, who's got no hope can't possibly be happy. In fact, life without it's almost unimaginable. That's a good paradox on which to finish. Thanks so much, everybody. A silver tongue, a nimble mind, a wonderful sense of humor, and a brilliant lecture. I want to thank uh, Professor Allett, and that was such a wimpy applause, I think he deserves another round. <laughs>